Good evening. It's an absolute delight to be with you again tonight. And tonight I'm going to cover two myths that are linked because they're connected with Spain. And I told my young associate, Father Gregorio, he is from Toledo, Spain, home of El Greco and home of Padre Gregorio Guapo. Uh, he, I wanted to present this because uh, for years and years, centuries, Spain has gotten a black eye because of these two myths. And I want to correct the record, not only for him, but for his whole country. And the first myth we're going to cover is the nefarious inquisition. And the second one that's linked to it is the black legend. And I'll explain that in the second session. So let's get started. For centuries, uh, you know, the, the myth goes that the church sponsored persecution, torture, death of thousands, perhaps even millions of people, innocent, through the nefarious inquisition. You know, there's ever a word for modern secularists that has become a symbol for the repression of freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom to do whatever you want, and all the other glorious freedoms so dear to the modern heart, it's that word, the Inquisition. For modern seculars, it's like a chilling word. Now, the authorized version of this myth is this. From the earliest days, the Catholic Church has persecuted dissent, starting with Christian heretics, and after the emperors became Christian, those poor, helpless, hapless pagans in the Roman Empire by torturing suspects and exterminating the recalcitrant. And this continued all the way through Catholic history. We find the church hunting down and massacring the easygoing civilized people of southern France, known as the Albigensians, because they dared to have their own thoughts or religion. And a little later, we had the very famous or infamous Spanish Inquisition, which would be responsible for millions of deaths. And then came the subsequent Roman Inquisition of the Counter-Reformation that was even crueler than the Spanish one, but though it was on a smaller scale. Then you add into that the torture and the burning of those accused of rich, witchcraft. And we know that because of the nauseating testimony of the actual 16th century inquisitor, Father Heinrich Kramer. And this intolerable practice only ceased when enlightened Protestants revolted against the church in the Protestant Reformation, and then still more enlightened Frenchmen and the revolutionaries, they started a great movement for human freedom that eventually spread around the world, ultimately to Russia, where it too threw off the shackles of the Russian Orthodox Church. And because of that, we should be so happy, so relieved, because we now have freedom of religion and don't have to look over our shoulder in fear of some persecution, we can believe anything or nothing, or we can make up our own religion without being arrested or burned at the stake. And this myth must be true, as I said, because this 16th century historian, whose work provided the foundation for these later expositions of the dark and evil history of the Inquisition, he had researched this and he reported it. And he was a priest, a Dominican. Now, just a footnote, he, this priest, Father Heinrich, Kramer was discredited even in his day, but people failed to mention that. And we'll get to that a little later. First of all, that's the myth. First, you've got to remember that this highly colored and misinformed view of the Inquisition comes mainly from the Reformation and the Enlightenment periods, the 16th and the 18th century. Like the propaganda, what I'll talk about a little later, called the Black Legend, the sinister Inquisition myth or lie was largely created by anti-Catholic thinkers who themselves were heretics or atheists, and they resented the church, and they resented any measure the church tried to curb their heresies. In addition to attacking the Catholic authorities who are currently opposing them, this Reformation era and Enlightenment era critics what they did is they went back in history and they identified themselves with all the medieval heretics and atheists, other heterodox or wrong thinkers who had ever dared to challenge the church. And they ultimately created then this myth 
about free thinking, real Christians who operated outside the ecclesial structures for centuries, suffering at times persecution from the Catholic Church all the way from the Roman time, and finally it morphed into their protests that resulted in the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Now this great myth and echoes of it, it continues to turn up in historical writings and popular literature even today. President Barack Obama and President Clinton, they both use this whole thing about the Inquisition in some of their talks. And people just buy into it because they just have little basic knowledge. But thanks be to God that historians like Edward Peters in his great book, Inquisition, it served to demolish this myth and to present the true historical reality and the facts about the Inquisition. See, it's important to have clear thinking and accurate facts to knowing what is the historical truth about the Inquisition. Because I'm telling you, there are many, many lies and false facts. For example, how many actual heretics were killed? You'll hear some of the numbers are outlandish, but they're not true. Now, what was the fundamental questions or principles underlying the church's concern with false teaching? Well, the fundamental question at issue is this. Does a person have a right to think and act upon any and all ideas, no matter how false or morally depraved? Well, the traditional Catholic view, dating all the way back to St. Augustine, said error has no rights. Now, does that mean the Catholic Church had prosecuted every erroneous opinion about the faith? Certainly not. Another fundamental Catholic principle is that Free conscience must not be forced. In fact, where there was ever forced uh, conversion or attempts to do that, the church roundly always condemned it. Now, private belief is one thing, but private practice or practice is another thing. Attempting to spread a false idea or an immoral practice is quite another issue than just simply holding contrary views to the church. And in the case of an unbeliever, the perennial practice of the church was always to spare neither prayer nor a little bit of pain in attempting to lead that person back into the fold of Christ. Now, the church did not prosecute any individual person merely for his beliefs. A procedure that would, you know, it would never really attract people to the truth. What the church was always trying to do was persuade those people in error to what the truth really was. It was only when uh, that person, the heretic, attempted to proselytize or convert other people to false religions or to organize immoral religious practices that the church and Catholic states of Christendom, they took action to stop this activity for both the sake of the heretic and his soul, and the souls of all the people that this guy might lead astray. Again, the belief that the church worked in was this. Catholics have always held that the soul is immeasurably more important than the body. Therefore, one who destroys, you see, the, the faith and grace in the life of a soul is far more guiltier than someone who even killed a person. Another issue is that believers of all religion up until very recent history They've always considered uh, as absolutely false and pernicious this modern attitude that it doesn't really matter what one believes and that all religions or non-religions are equally good. The traditional principle enunciated by Tertullian and other the church fathers and found all through the church's writing and preaching ever since is that heresy must not be allowed to spread because why? It destroys souls. So, let's examine the, these principles as they were implemented historically in the church throughout her history. Now, there's no question that the first generation of Christians, they operated on the principle that our Lord laid down, that they were to convert the whole world, go out and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything that I've taught you, huh? In other words, by preaching and then by the example of their selfless love, their faith, and their courage, to win a world over. Whenever experienced people who began to wander, we hear in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 15, if one of the converted begins to hold false ideas, 
then another Christian is to go respectfully to that person and try to help him see his error. If that doesn't work, the scripture says what? Bring representatives of the church to try to convince them. And if that doesn't work, if that fails, they have to then give up on him for that time being and treat him as they would a non-believer or a non-Christian. In serious cases, this use of the church's mandate uh, to bind and to loose, you find that in, when Peter was appointed uh, the head of the church, Matthew 16, 16 and 19, when here are the keys of the kingdom. What do you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed. That idea of binding and loosing, in effect, would be a process that if someone wasn't going to listen, was not walking in community, they would be excommunicated, excommunione, huh? It would be a parallel to what the Jewish people used to do when they cast heretics out from the synagogue. Now, there's no issue of physical corporal punishment. It's simply a spiritual matter. The, uh, the um, famous people trying to blank. Come on, they don't like electricity. Amish people. They have a process they call it shunning, huh? Shun. That was the whole process. They, they sh these people were shunned. They were outsiders now until they could see their uh, false ways. Now, in later generations, the early Christians faced more deadly threats from heretics who not only preached false Christian doctrines, but they often led a number of them away from the church and out of the church. What do you do about them, the church asked. Certainly they shouldn't be allowed to destroy the faith of so many souls. Uh-uh. Well, in a, in a very few, in a very, in, in few very early Christian documents, one reads the word exterminare, which has some been, sometimes been translated as you exterminate them to the glee of the people that want to push this very nefarious myth of the Inquisition. You exterminate. But that's not the way it is translated. Exterminare means to put someone outside the borders, the termini, extermini, outside the area. In other words, exterminare meant you expel or exile someone. If he's causing a problem here in this community, he is expelled from the community or from the country. So he can't propagate this false teaching that would eventually uh, disrupt the peace and order and unity of a country. If they really meant to kill someone, it would be, these words would be used. A munda exterminari per mortem. To put someone outside the boundaries, the border of this world, through death. But to exile people. The idea of, behind exile was the fact that it got rid of doctrinal corruption by how? You deport them, send them away. The early Christian church was not interested in persecuting people, punishing people. They had enough of that through their sickening persecutions. But they were in favor of exporting the pernicious idea. Now this seems to have been generally true with, uh, with some exception after the Roman Empire became Christian and even after the emperors became Christian. They had some cracking down like uh, as I said last week on maybe not uh, supporting the, Rome, uh, the pagan temples but they had no way did they persecute them like the Romans persecuted the Christians, the, the horrific tortures and death. That just didn't happen. The reason is, is that they believed that conscience should not be violated at all, that you trust it. And most, most of the Roman emperors, by the way, they were mostly interested in maintaining the peace in the empire. Whatever it took. I mentioned last week, Constantine kind of played both sides against the middle because he wanted just unity and peace in his empire. When did the changes begin to happen? Well, they began to happen when the great heresies began to emerge. And the first and the greatest of all the heresies really was a heresy called Arianism. It was by far the worst heresy to emerge within the Roman Empire. The collection of these heretical ideas can only be called really a historical phenomenon. And the reason for that is it went way beyond just theology. Huh? It affected politics church-state relations, it affected historical developments, not just in that time, but for centuries to come. Henri Daniel Ropes, a great Catholic historian, he calls Arianism the great assault on faith by the mind 
and he considered it the most formidable heresy of the church's history. John Henry Newman, Cardinal Newman, became a convert to the church from the Anglican faith. He produced a whole classical study on it called The Arians of the Fourth Century. What was this heresy? Well, it originated in Alexandria, Egypt, taught, and it was in the fourth century, it originated with a Catholic priest named Arius. He was about 60 years old. He was an ascetic and a scholar. He was a very fabulous preacher, and people just flocked to him and hung in every word he said. But he was the one that came with the conclusion that Jesus Christ was not truly divine. He was just a creature of God with some divine attributes. Now, of course, the church has always taught that Jesus Christ was true God, true man, one divine person, two natures. Now, we had that articulation, but it wasn't as articulated at that time. The church was coming to grips with how do we express this reality that was revealed to us? How do we explain it in concepts and words? And it was still coming to understand that at this very time. In fact, it was this heresy that ultimately led to the articulation of it. Well, this heresy led to divergent theories and Arius became fabulously uh, popular, delighting the Greek Christian audiences far beyond uh, uh, Alexandria. And even the pagans, they loved it because of its elegant kind of formulations and its equivocation as to the person of Jesus. Well, this controversy literally roared through the entire empire, often put leaders at odds with each other. In fact, at one point in the church, the majority of Catholic bishops were Arians and not Orthodox. That was one of the end result. That's why Constantine called the Great Council of Nicaea to pull them all together to make an articulation. Why? Because this thing was not just a theological problem. It was dividing the unity of his empire. Now, even though the heresy was condemned at the Council of Nicaea in 325, the heresy had already spread throughout the whole empire, leading to the split in the church, and then many Catholics being persecuted, great saints like Athanasius, St. Cyril, whose feast day we celebrated two days ago. He was exiled twice for holding to the truth about Jesus, confronting the Arian heresy. But by the end of the fourth century, Arianism in the, within the empire had started to dissipate the influence because of the Council of Nicaea, the proclamation of that, the Roman Empire standing behind, uh, the Roman Emperor, Constantine standing behind it, and the successive empires emperors. But what had happened to Arianism? By a very clever priest and went up in a missionary activity to all the northern tribes, the German tribes, and they adopted that like that. It was perfect for them. They were tribal people, warlike. It was very simple religion with simple rules, and it had uh, a lot of outdoor rituals out in the forest. It just fit their warrior mentality. So all the Germanic tribes became Aryan, save one, the Franks. They stayed with their old pagan ways, but eventually they were converted and eventually they became the eldest daughter of the church. And ultimately they would throw in their power with Rome up the road. <clears throat> but the other groups, they kept to this, uh, to these Aryan philosophy and it was very difficult it was difficult for the Catholic missionaries to evangelize, and they were antithetical to the Roman Empire because the church was identified also with the Roman Empire. So it really caused a breakdown in the society and the inability to recruit them. So it became very clear to the Christians of the early centuries that heresy was not just a harmless matter of personal opinion. It could and did affect the destiny of nations. So it had to be combated wherever it appeared by attempting first to convert the heretic and in some extreme cases by exiling that person in order to present any further damage to the community of the faithful or to the nation itself. The Inquisition, which is a court of inquiry into the orthodoxy of a religious views of an individual or of a group, a sect, the Inquisition began when heresy began to be viewed as treason. Remember I talked about it, it just wasn't a, a theological issue. When all of a sudden different groups within the nation, because the nations were forming, started having this, it started dividing the country. And that's where the Inquisition came in. Until the high Middle Ages, the 12th and 13th century, 
the inquiries were generally locally applied and executed there. Now, most bishops who were in charge of their particular area, like Archbishop Gomez would be in charge of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, uh, he was, his responsibility was to make sure the orthodoxy of that area. Well, most of them were very busy and they had little interest in really doing that. So, in the 13th century, Pope Innocent III, he was really concerned about suppressing heresy and banishing da dangerous heretics, especially like the Cathars who were in his time, and I'll explain that. He was very lenient to those people who had doubtful orthodoxy. Never mentioned the death penalty. His policies, you see, were a great improvement upon what the secular order was doing. But something happened in the 13th century. What happened was the church took an interest in investigating heresy. There was two reasons for that. First, because rulers and those who are ruled were both Catholic and any threat to the faith meant a threat to the whole realm, to the whole nation. Second, because many heretics did not confine their preaching to spiritual matters, but actually advocated subversive political policies and even saying that there should be no temporal authority over you at all, that you should be your own God unto yourself. Well, that did not sit well with the secular world at all. The secular leaders were very harsh with these people. The church was different in approach. An early example of, of state hostility towards heresy would be uh, seen in the Constitution of Melfi. It was promulgating the Kingdom of Sicily by King Frederick II. He was a particularly brutal and unscrupulous ruler. And his hostility was directed towards a group of people called the Paterines. Who were they? Originally, they were uh, groups of people in Italy who were particularly zealous for reform at a time when the church was trying to root out a lot of immorality, a lot of abuses like simony, selling uh, sacred offices, and other kinds of immorality. In the 11th century in Florence, there was a group called the Paterini, which are also the same as the Paterines. They'd been active in criticizing clerical abuse and immorality. Initially, they had the support of the papacy, but it wasn't long before they began to take more and more heterodoxical positions. For example, immoral priests, they said no longer had uh, the authority or the ability to do sacraments because their priesthood was invalid because they were immoral. That goes way back to a question about ex opere operato. Does a sacrament work even if the priest is a sinner? And the answer is yes, it does. But they were saying just the different. No, it doesn't because he's invalidated because he is a immoral person. Well, the Paterines became more and more militant and more heterodox, teaching more and more false truth. And they began to take matters in their own hand to try to reform the church. Like they would uh, attack wealthy clergy because they weren't living a, a simple life and they literally would storm the house, rob it blind because they felt this was their right because this person wasn't living right. The Paterines also adopted ideas from the Bogomils, which were heretics from the Balkan countries. And they eventually, this group would morph into a group called the Cathars. Now, Frederick went after him, not for theological reasons. I mean, Frederick II himself eventually became a heretic. He wanted to set up his own church. He went after them because why? It was disrupting the kingdom of Sicily. And so he attacked them, and viciously so, even murdering a lot of them, because he wouldn't tolerate heresy. It was very clear in Sicilian law that heresy was equated with literally treason. That's why people were executed. This would be the, uh, feature, uh, the feature of most heresies during the high and late Middle Ages. There would be no longer a question of someone being wrong about teachings like, say, the Trinity or the Incarnation. Uh-uh. The reason why they were so attacked is they were very anti-social groups whose ideas and behavior often undermined the very fabric of a community or a society or a nation. So the increasing involvement of the state in these investigations started to happen at this time. In the 13th century, the Pope assigned two mendicant orders, the Dominicans and Franciscans, to lead the investigations. They were in charge of it. And, uh, and their whole purpose was not to punish people, but rather try to convert them, 
convince them of their errors. In fact, there's examples of in medieval inquisitors, these priests spending hours and hours and hours trying to explain to an accused man of his ways, why they were uh, wrong. And oftentimes they were very, very successful. So the, the primary task of an inquisitor was not to punish, it was to literally get someone to repent, to return back to the church. And if he didn't succeed in doing so, literally he had failed in his whole, whole objective. Punishment for publicly professing heresy, especially for Palmagidia, were generally not severe in the early uh, medieval period. They ranged from things like having to go on a pilgrimage or undergoing a period of imprisonment. And it has to be said that in some places, especially when the Catharsic had aroused such hostility of the population, there are examples certainly by the secular order that they literally uh, rounded up some of these people and killed them, but it wasn't the church's work. See, a lot of what happens is what the state was doing is conflated with what the church is doing. In many other places, executions were practically literally non-existent for centuries, and even imprisonment was very, very mild. For example, there's records showing that a prisoner while serving his prison term came down with an illness. So what does jailers do? They let him out of jail, go home and get well, and then come back, and he did. Another person, he wanted to attend a relative, a, friend, a funeral of a relative, so they let him out of jail, and he was asked to return, and he did. Because the church's prisons were far better than any prison in those days, and they were far more compassionate and kind. What happened? How did the rigor or the, the punishment start to grow more severe? Well, there was two developments in the 13th century that led to more severe penalties. Number one, the first was the revival of Roman law by legal scholars, and it was adapted by governments of most states in Europe. And among the provisions adopted was the use of torture merely for the process of interrogation, not for punishment, for interrogation. And it had to be specifically applied. You could only do it once. It was to a limited amount to no loss of limb or your life, okay? It would only be administered once though. And it wasn't to really endanger people. That's important because assume that this torture process was used to punish people, it wasn't. Sometimes the secular order did, not the church though. In later centuries, particularly in Protestant countries, various forms of torture were used as punishment as we're gonna see. One of the famous inquisit inquisitors of all time was a guy named Jacques Fournier. He was the future Pope Benedict XII. Uh, he interviewed over 930 suspected heretics during his career. He never once ever used torture. He was that skilled in just talking to people, get them to present what their issues was and to explain them. And his penalties were very, very mild, ranging from a pilgrimage to wearing a cross, maybe exile or imprisonment. His entire career, he turned over 42 heretics to the state. So another thing you need to know, the church never executed anybody. It was forbidden. But they turned him over to the state. They redeemed as people who were qualified to die, but the church always asked for mercy. The state oftentimes ignored the petition of the church because they deemed this person as very dangerous to their, to their political power, to the unity. So that was the first development, the introduction of torture. The second development that led to increased rigor in dealing with heresy was a formidable threat posed by the Cathar heresy. That was a heresy that was one of the most bizarre, weirdest, yet one of the most dangerous uh, in the Middle Ages. It's often called the Albigensian heresy, a name taken literally from the region where this, this sect settled in southern France, a place called Albi, huh? so the Albigensians. And it existed there in that country for, uh, for, cent uh, for many, many decades under all various kinds of guises and names. Properly speaking, Albigensium wasn't really a heresy, because a heresy is what? It's something that, it's a false teaching that grows up within the church. This didn't. Previously, this heresy was connected to a group called the Bogomils, who lived over in the Balkans. They were very active during the Dark Ages, and they, then they spread into Italy, and then they spread through the southern part of Europe. 
It became by the, known by the name of Catharism when it settled into France. And its teachings were bizarre, really bizarre and strange. It developed from the Eastern Manichaean roots, and it had what we call a radical dualism. There was a god of good and a god of evil. Spirit was good, matter was evil. Procreation was evil, women needed to be suspected. There were a lot of heavy rumors, the fact that uh, many of the Cathars practiced homosexuality to avoid creating other human beings because that would make more evil. That's their kind of thinking. Civil authorities also could have no claim in Cathars because part of the religion said there is no authority over you. You're your own person. You're not to listen to anybody. So they were professing literally a, a sense of rebellion. And also, if you wanted to become perfect as a Cathar, you had to be absolutely detached from all material things. Literally, you became perfect as a Cathar if you literally would starve yourself to death. So disassociated from anything material. And a Cathar may start out that way, and there's history recorded that some people started, but they were getting hungry, and his friends helped them along to the end by tying them down and not letting them eat. Didn't get a chance. It's bizarre, it's theory. But why did it have such an appeal to people there? One, because the Cathar missionaries were incredible fanatics through and through, and they were incredible in their appeal, very clever. What they would often do was point to the example of the Catholic clergy and their immorality. And there was a lot of that immorality going on in a very lax atmosphere in southern France at that time. They point that out and they would contrast the priest behavior. Look at the Cathars. They're very ascetic, very disciplined, very moral, at least in their terms. That was one thing. The second is they were quick to point out their grievances to the people in southern France. They said, you guys are second class citizens down here. The king lives up in the north. He doesn't care about you. You should, you should have your own place. You should have independence. And what, isn't the Catholic Church an ally to the king who lives up north? They started this divisive nature. Now, it, it, it's really very probable that very few Catholics embraced the Cathars' doctrine. But they were stirred by this idea of independence and rebellion. A.L. Mayock explains it in his book, The Inquisition, that the theology of Cathar dualism developed as it grew more popular and entrenched in south of France, assuming the form of a definitely anti-social philosophy aiming at the literal destruction of society. So as this escalation, as this, as this problem began to escalate, Pope Innocent III sent a delegation of Dominicans to the area called Languedoc. And and he went and sent him there. St. Dominic was part of that delegation. And Dominic uh, uh, kind of rebuked a man who was working on Sunday. It was forbidden by the third commandment. And the whole population turned him, almost killed St. Dominic for simply preaching the truth. Well, in 1207, some Cathar, some radicals, they killed a senior legate who had been sent by the king to excommunicate and also by the, the bishop the Count Raymond of Toulouse, and they placed an interdict on the land. That means you got no, and you couldn't sell your stuff anywhere, no one would buy it. It was really a, a economically and emotionally and spiritually, uh, spiritual devastation. Because with the interdict, you could lose your crown and then people would cut your head off. Well, the Count of Toulouse quickly repented and reunited with the church. But the fact of the matter is, when they, the senior legate who went down to present that, when he was killed, it started a whole chain reaction. King of France mobilized a military action against them because not only was the teaching heretical and false, but they were subversive to the Christian order and the unity of his, of his empire, of the, of the land of uh, France. And furthermore, the espousals of the sect by local re, uh, rulers in southern France they started a rebellion of independence to literally divide the country. So the King of France waged a war. It's called the Albigensian Crusade. This thing is still brought up as a way to club the, the church uh, on the head with it, saying, look, this is the result of the Inquisitions. The church didn't have anything to do with it. It was a king fighting for his unity of his, 
of his, of his nation and the, and the peace of his nation. The Albigensian Crusade lasted only about two months. The conflict between the north and the south part of France, that went on over a period of 20 years. But what stirred a lot of this was this false teachings or false statements. We call it fake news today. Like for example, uh, the story goes that one military engagement, it was said that a papal legate shouted out, kill them all, God will know his own. Well, as you go through the whole history of this, he didn't say it at all. Some guy made it up and put it in the mouth of this legate, recorded it as such, and that has been pushed through history all the way down even to the current time. It was not until the end of the uh, 13th century in the reign of King Philip the Fair that this area of Albi, Albigensian, Languedoc, was finally brought firmly under the control of the King of France. And they finally had a united country. The Cathars didn't disappear at the time. They merely went underground. It was only in the early years of the 14th century that the surviving elements of Catharism were eliminated from the region, and largely due to a wonderful powerful, effective inquisitor named Bernard Gui. He interrogated over hundreds and hundreds of suspects, of whom 636 were punished, 40 were killed by the state, 300 with prison, and the rest received lighter sentences. Now, what was happening elsewhere in Catholic uh, Europe? Well, heresy was also being prosecuted, always beginning by, by attempting to, re, to uh, reform the heretic, need be, exile, execution was really rare. In England, between 1401 and 1485, for example, 11 heretics were burned. Now, they amid, amid, there, often you see there's a confusion and a blending of what the state was doing and the church was doing. And that really makes uh, history kind of murky. You have to be really dis discerning how to figure this out. The fact that matters in some areas, Little distinction was made between heresy and rebellion, and when it came to rebellion, you were executed, but the church got kind of painted with the brush of being uh, very cruel, and then it, it wasn't. Again, the church only judged the orthodoxy of somebody. Heresy not only had theological implications, but it also had political implications. When they're judged, they turned into the state, and the state, with a plea of mercy, the state sometimes listened, but most of the time did, they executed. Now the best known of all the inquisitions is the one called the Spanish Inquisition. And it's been tied to the second legend or myth that I'm gonna talk about, it's called the Black Legend. Thanks be to God that there's been revisions of this Spanish Inquisition, uh, this myth. Uh, for example, uh, Harry, Harry, Henry Cayman, his Called the, he wrote a book called The Spanish Inquisition, Historical Revision. What he did, which a lot of uh, historians didn't do, the historian, a lot of historians in the modern 1900s just went back to the Enlightenment period, took people like Gibbons, those kinds of people who were very anti-Catholic, hated the church, and they just used them as their original sources. But personally, I came and went back to the original sources and began to sort through it, the actual records of the Spanish Inquisition, and they, his work has been uh, helpful to demolish these long-held myths. Now, one myth spun by the English Protestant writers had to do with sadistic tortures, supposedly used by the Spanish Inquisition, the priests and the church. It turns out, as I mentioned, torture was very rarely used. And when it was, it was very limited. In one group of 7,000 accused per persons who came before the Inquisition in Valencia, only 2% were tortured and no more for no more than 15 minutes at a time. Executions were rare. Even the prisons of the Inquisition musician were far more uh, mild and accommodating than those of the secular order. In fact, there's records saying that prisoners did something, tried to get out of the secular prison into the church prison because it was a billion times better, much more comfortable and easy for them. And it was also the fact that in the church you could make an appeal for example, the famous case of St. Joan of Arc in England, when she was accused of heresy, because it was a trumped up trial, but she made an appeal to Rome. And it was denied to her, but she made this appeal because the church always had this appeal process. Where did the Spanish Inquisition come from? Well, it began under King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. 
in the 15th century. What was the historical context? If you remember your history, Spain uh, was literally, had been invaded in the 6th and 7th century by the Muslims. Tariq, a famous Muslim general in the year 711, crossed over from Africa onto the Spanish territory, and he claimed it for the nation Islam. Stuck a flag there on a big rock, and at that rock is still remembered for that event. His name was Tariq. Rock in Arabic is Gibal, you get the word Gibraltar. Huh? Gibal Tariq is where it came from. But they made the invasion then, and then they literally occupied for almost uh, 700 plus years Spain. And um, when the, the reconquest, the reconquista started with Ferdinand and Isabella pushing out the Muslims, they, they encountered different groups that were in that country. There were the Muslims that they pushed out, but there were also what we call the original Catholic uh, people, Spaniards of the Visigothic origin, the, the traditional tribal people there. There were practicing Muslims, practicing Jews, converted Jews and converted Muslims. They were all this disparate group living within the country. Many Muslims became Christian, some authentic, most of them didn't. And some Jews became Christian, a lot of them uh, authentic, some weren't. The problem was that they became kind of like a fifth column for the enemy, trying to subvert this attempt to to t retake, reconquer Spain, and create a one nation for the Spanish people. That's what led to the Inquisition, to decide whether someone was really uh, truly a convert to the church, really professing faith or not. So, although the Inquisition is essentially a church court of inquiry, as I said, what happened in Spain, it began to be controlled by the crown, a fact that caused a lot of friction between the papacy and the king himself. Once unification was achieved, the more the more is being driven out of Granada in 1492, well, the Inquisition in Spain became less and less prominent. The situation lasted until the Spanish Reformation when Charles V and his son Philip II reactivated the dormant Inquisition. For what reason? Well, a couple things they had begun to see the effects of the Protestant Reformation up north. The ideas that uh, Martin Luther spawned created what they call the Peasants' War, and it literally divided countries. And Philip II was scared, as his father was, of that coming to Spain. So they reactivated to the, the Inquisition to judge uh, whether these things, well, basically, to keep people out telling them very clearly, you come here, you're going to be judged, and it could be your life if you come here. The Inquisition remained in existence in Spain, uh, as I said, looking out for Protestant missionaries coming across the board. And the very presence of this court seems to have had the desired effect because uh, in the century of the Reformation, the Spanish Inquisition, in cooperation with state, only executed 182 heretics, or less than two a year. By comparison, the Protestant persecutions of the Catholics in England, Ireland, Netherlands, and elsewhere in Northern Europe, together with the wars of religion, it took literally tens of thousands of lives. Again, a lot of these figures are conflated under the Catholic Church, and they're not. Protestants had a whole bunch of things going up in their way that the Catholics had nothing to do with. Besides the Spanish Inquisition, we had the Roman Inquisition. During the 16th century, a tribunal was set up in Rome, again, to deal with what? The threat of Protestantism coming down into Italy, Malta, and a few other territories. And the tribunal also dealt with accusations of witchcraft and other um, accusations of uh, people teachings, maybe quasi-heretical teachings. You know, this was the Inquisition, by the way, that tried Galileo. And that'll be another myth we'll come to up the road but it was the Italian Inquisition that tried Galileo. Again, the Inquisition of Italy, it found very few heretics, very few, even less than that, received the death sentence. For example, in the Venetian Republic from the mid-16th century to the mid-17th century, 100 years, there were four executions, 
out of 1,000 cases. And there were similar single-digit uh, executions elsewhere throughout all of Italy. In fact, in the course of the entire Italian Inquisition, nearly 200 years existence, some tens of thousands of cases were investigated with a small number. Uh, the most accurate number we can get is that uh, two percent ended in some sentence, particularly death. In fact, by the mid-19th century, the career of the Italian Inquisition was largely over, though it was picked up again, just like the Muslims picked up the word crusade. That wasn't part of their language for a thousand years. They picked it up when the English and the French in their colonies talked about they were there as the new crusaders and oppressed the people in the modern age. And it was at that time they picked up the crusades. The crusades weren't even mentioned in Islam history. Well, same thing happened when Italy started going through its, its process of becoming a country. These free thinkers, these revolutionaries, used the word inquisition as kind of their rallying cry. In the rest of the Italian streets, local governments had phased out the inquisition really by the 18th century. Now, I'd like to just take a moment to compare the justice of the inquisition, both in Spain and in uh, France, excuse me, Spain and Italy, a little bit in England. I'd like to compare that with what was happening in the rest of Europe. During the 16th and 17th centuries, punishments for various offenses included such cruelties as disembowelment, gouging out the eyes of an offender. Until the 19th century in England included capital punishment for simply stealing a shilling or cutting down a tree. A lot of the false ideas of what supposedly went on in the church courts and the prisons of the Catholic Inquisition seem to be drawn from what actually went on in the secular justice systems in Protestant countries, particularly England following Henry VIII's break from the church. For example, you've always heard about the Iron Maid in that box that has spikes and they close it in on you and they pierce you. That's the Spanish Inquisition. Ah, not correct. That was actually a gruesome divorce, uh, torture device that the Germans used. Spanish never used it. It was up in Protestant Germany. Likewise, the distinction between the use of torture in inquiry by Inquisition courts, done only with very strict limitation, remember once and no more than like 15 minutes, and no damage to limb or to life. Well, in the Protestant areas, torture began use as a punishment by the secular courts, particularly in Northern Europe. It was said that Queen Elizabeth I, she enjoyed reading the nauseating accounts of her notorious inquisitor, Topcliffe, she loved to read that while she was eating her meals, you know, it just took a delight. It was also said that during Elizabeth's reign that the rack was never silent, as many English martyrs would attest to. The rack is they would tie your arms, your feet, and they would just roll these things and they would just stretch you and tear you right apart, you know, and often uh, torture you. Also, there was a, a very charming English custom of hanging, drawing, and quartering a condemned prisoner. He was forced, dragged through the streets until he came to his place of execution. And then he was hung till he was nearly dead. Then they'd drop him, let him revive a little bit. Then they would disembowel him, take out his intestines and put him in a pot to boil right in front of him while he was still alive. Then they would attach him to arm and legs to four different horses and send him in four different directions. And there you get it, hung, drawn, and quartered. You saw that in that movie, um, Braveheart, huh? at the very end, that was the whole issue of that. Now, I know of no incident in history that the Catholic Inquisitional Courts ever, ever did anything like that. What about the issue of witches and witchcraft? The Inquisition was not interested in witchcraft, really. Now, these practices existed way back in ancient times. You know, there's recordings that many of the great saints of the early church went against these sorcerers and they literally did things even greater, we consider it by uh, Satan's power, did things greater than the, uh, the saints themselves. And, um, and, and I was reading an interesting thing about that is that witchcraft for always had some of the same practices, even though they were in totally different areas of the, of the continent at different times, they always seemed to have the same evil practices, which kind of things that there's, 
that Satan is not too creative. He just uses the same tactics. But it's very interesting, kind of a little creepy. But by the time the conversion of Europe had been achieved, the witchcraft, occult, they literally retreated to the margins of life, uh, of life and society. Uh, and there was a healthy skepticism about it all. In fact, in early medieval kings, St. Alfred the Great rejected the suggestion that, that he investigate the activity of witches with the explanation quia non sunt, that's Latin for, because there isn't any. As for the Inquisition, it was forbidden literally in the 13th century for bothering witch witchcraft witch cases, because why? Its focus was on doctrinal heresy, not on superstition or black magic. That same attitude prevailed through the age of faith, but it changed a bit in the 15th century when heresy, some heresy began to get mixed up with occult practices. But in many cases, these investigations were really turned out to be the results of popular acclamation. Someone saying he or she's a witch, and when the church looked at it, said no. In the 16th century, the famous witchcraft heresy that gripped, gripped Northern Europe. Well, again, who's up in Northern Europe at this time? It's the Protestants. And they were spurred by Martin Luther, who saw a devil behind every post and pillar and rock. And fomed, uh, fomented by that, the Protestant sects uh, literally had gone on this witch hunt, and many, many people died. It's interesting that literally by the 18th century, many of those sects literally didn't believe in the presence of, of Satan and uh, removed it from all their catechisms. So from the earlier period, though, arise many lurid accounts of torture and burning, and they were wrongly associated with the, uh, the Catholic uh, Inquisition. Again, the church didn't do any of this stuff. This was done by a lot of the local people. Sometimes there were Catholic uh, rulers. A lot of times they were Protestant. So the moral of the story is, is basically this. Uh, you gotta be careful about what you're reading and who you're reading. Where, uh, where did, uh, wherever witchcraft was, it was mainly instigated by a guy that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. His name was Father Henri Kramer, a Dominican. He wrote a book called Malaeus Maleficarum. And it was a lurid account of investigation of witchcraft by an inquisitor named Henrik Kramer, who was censored and then fired as an inquisitor within a few years of writing the book. Uh, the, so he basically made all this stuff up and he was discredited even in his own time. But his book still exists and people still draw from that all these lurid accounts of terrible torture and killing. Another widely used source, again, a false source, fake news, was a 19th century uh, French writer History of, uh, writing history of the Inquisitions. His name was Etienne Leon de La Motte Langon. He wrote very detailed accounts of witchcraft and rich trials, large numbers of horrid executions. And these were all accepted at face value literally up to the 1970s. Thanks be to God, a historian named Norman Cohn, he smelled a rat and he began to investigate both this author's scholarly credentials and his facts, and he turned out to be just the opposite wrong. There's also other historical uh, sources that, again, are flat out wrong. The moral is this. Take anything on witchcraft written before the 1970s with a very large grain of salt because so much of it is just bogus. Huh? The newest estimates are that most execution for witchcraft by local secular courts, not ecclesiastical ones, not church ones, occurred in Protestant Germany and Switzerland, and they numbered close to 20,000 people. In Catholic Ireland, the figure seems to be in exactly four. Ironically, at the very same times here in this country, we had the Salem witch trials, huh? And during that, a woman was accused and summoned before the Inquisition Court in Mexico on a charge of witchcraft, possibly at the request of her neighbors. Well, she was completely exonerated by the church, and the priests who were spurred on by his people they were uh, reprimanded for being so gullible and acting unjustly. Sadly, the Salem witches didn't get that kind of protection at all. They all died. Now, what are the benefits of the, uh, of the Inquisition? You know, people say, what do you mean benefits? There were great benefits. As we've seen, the original goal of the Inquisition was to protect the purity of the faith in the souls of the faithful, because our thing is, we're here for a short time. Our real destiny is heaven. 
And we don't want to lose heaven for something we're missing here. And that's why the church was so eager to convince people about the truth. <clears throat> it should be obvious that there's no obligation to tolerate errors. I know we live in a world that says everything's the same. It's what you think it is. Yeah. When people start saying that to me, I say, well, then give me your $100 bill and I'll give you one because it's all what I think it is. And, you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous when you start pointing out the inconsistency of the arguments. But there is no obligation to tolerate errors in doctrine that can endanger everlasting life for a soul. And why? As I mentioned before, because the destruction of the life of a soul is considered a far eternal more badly, uh, bad evil than even the murder of the body. So therefore, heretics who would destroy a soul of other people either had to be converted or prevented from doing harm to that person either by being exiled, in extreme cases, by a death penalty. Sadly, as I have been mentioning, political motives were often mixed with religious uh, intent, such as uh, Catharism, huh? It just wasn't preaching a bad theology and bad doctrine. It was preaching rebellion against the state. And it often meant then that the state used the church court to assess if this person was right or wrong and the church, as I said, would hand him to the state to be punished in some sort, often asking for mercy. Sometimes, the, and many times, the state didn't listen to it because they were afraid about the disunification and the rebellion that it would lead to. Also, the church was able to exercise little control over the methods used by the secular order. Now, there can't be any doubt that in most periods the, uh, that the inquisitions did really, really good work for souls. The sinister dualism of the Cathars would certainly have it triumphed in south of France and resulted in such chaos because of their bizarre teaching and bizarre philosophy. Even Henry Lee, uh, Charles Lee, he was a fierce anti-Catholic, fierce. He admitted in the case of the Cathars that the church was absolutely right and as he quoted on the side of the angels because it was so bizarre and so destructive to society. Likewise, the preserva uh, preser preservation of Spanish Catholicism, particularly when the Protestants started to filter down from Northern Europe into Spain, the Inquisition was enough to threaten them. If they come in, they're gonna be judged and maybe even executed, it kept them out to keep what was a tremendous effort to unify that nation state through the efforts of Ferdinand and Isabella and their successors. Now, were there cruel inquisitors in some place? Of course. You always got some bad apples, huh? Okay. Were methods of interrogation distasteful to modern sensibilities? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we could say that, especially now. But I can think of uh, worse methods employed even now in many enlightened minds. Uh, how about late-term abortion? I don't hear much comment about that, huh? Well, I can talk about a lot of things. Execution of people now uh, through lethal injection because they're... Uh, a burden on family and maybe a burden financially on an insurance company, we encourage them. I can think of a lot of horrific things, huh? So it's amazing how we, can, we don't have the same way of judging past by what's going on today. Given the formable tax of guarding the purity of the faith in Christian souls, the overall record of the Inquisition in dealing with heresy and its consequences is not only defensible, but really, I would say it's admirable. So in conclusion, pretty much everything that people have heard and perhaps believe about the Inquisition, it's pure bunk. In fact, in 1998, Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul II, he opened the archives of the Holy Office to a team of 30 scholars from around the world. And they produced a 800-page report in 2004 and it confirmed the discoveries of many historians from the early research in other European archives. And it reads this way. The popular view of the Inquisition is a myth. Most people accused of heresy by the Inquisition were either acquitted or their sentences suspended. Those found guilty of grave error were allowed to confess their sin, do penance, and be restored to the body of Christ. Unrepentant or obstinate heretics were excommunicated and then given over to secular authorities. Despite popular myth, the Inquisition did not kill or burn heretics. The simple fact is that the medieval Inquisition saved uncounted thousands of innocent and not so innocent people. 
who would have otherwise been roasted by secular lords or mob rule. It was only much later that the Inquisition, as I mentioned, got conflated with the state, taken over by civil authorities, and the forgiveness and mercy shown by the church didn't prevail in many cases. So in summary, the myth about the nefarious Inquisition really comprises four major lies that make up this big false myth. Number one, the sources from which the opponents of the church drew their information were mainly very anti-Catholic sources written by Protestants in both the 16th and 18th century who opposed the church and wanted to undermine the church as well as the rationalists later on. Number two, what was being judged was heresy. And heresy was more than just a religious matter, trying to maintain the purity and the authenticity of the faith and the salvation of souls. That was the most important issue of all life, and that should be our important thing. Why do we want to seek people and correct them of their errors? But heresy wasn't just theological. It also undermined the safety and stability of civil society as well as the life of the church. Number three, the church mainly judged the orthodoxy or the non-orthodoxy of someone's belief, often protecting people from false accusations. The state or country carried out the penalty, often ignoring the church's plea for mercy. And number four, what the state government did and what Protestants did are often conflated with what Catholics did with the Inquisition, especially when it comes to torture and the numbers of people executed. So perhaps for the modern secularists, the politicians, and the media, maybe they should be the ones who be put on trial for spreading so much false information about this myth, namely for centuries. The Catholic Church sponsored the persecution, the torture, the death of thousands, perhaps even millions of innocent people through the nefarious Inquisition. Considering these facts I just gave you, those modern secularists, if they went on trial, would be found guilty. Amen. Let's take a little break, rest our, our backside, get some refreshments, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. The last myth for the night is the black and expedient legend. And it goes this way, that the Spanish explorers of the New World were cruel, they were greedy, carrying out the orders of their Catholic masters and bringing such untold misery to those very peaceful Native Americans, both in North America and South America, or Central America. Now, when we come to this myth, it, it really exemplifies how historical lies are often a result of a combination of motives. So the black legend says that Spanish were historically very cruel and brutal people, and evidenced by the way they treated the Native American tribes that they conquered in the 16th century. And the fact that the conquistadors came, a lot of them, most of them from Spain, which was a Catholic country, and they were Catholic, well, it made it even worse. And the missionaries they brought along, they were viciously suppressed the religion and culture of very highly sophisticated, civilized people, such as the Aztecs, bringing death, disease, and servitude, or ramming Christianity down their throat. That's the myth. It's really a historical fairy tale. Where'd it come from? It was produced by the English and Dutch political propagandists. And they were motivated by what? Remember what's going on at this time in history. They were motivated by nationalism and colonial rivalry in the New World, as well as religious fanaticism as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Both England and Dutch had gone Protestant. It's only been quite recently, uh, I mean, even up to right quite recently, that English and American textbooks, they record a lot of these versions in them. I'm not gonna spend much time on it, you can read it in the notes, but it's amazing, you know. For example, in the 1966 edition of the American Nation, A History of the United States, Columbia University professor John Garrity, we learned that Spanish conquistadors and conquerors wrenched their empire from innocent hands. In an important sense, the settlement of America ranks among the worst examples of naked aggression in human history. That's just what, how the, a lot of this has played out. Well, the history has begun to change in the recent years because a number of well-trained historians are going back to original sources and not just drawing upon the, the Reformation and Enlightenment and rationalists of the 16th, 17th, 17th and 18th century. And thanks be to God, there's a revived version of this tired old tale. <coughs> the focus I wanna do in this session describes Spain's conquest in the New World, and particularly in Mexico. Okay, I'm gonna stay with just with that.
it's, it's very expansive. They had things down in South America, even Central America, but we're gonna stay with Mexico. We have, uh, we're more familiar with that area than anything else. What's the historical setting of the black legend? Well, remember I told you in the last session, King Ferdinand and Isabel, they combined their forces and they drove out the Muslims from Spain and reunited that country. And they then entered at that time, 1492, into a very golden age for themselves. Why? Well, because Queen Isabella sponsored Christopher Columbus who came here to America and lo and behold, they find a whole new territory and wonderfully they found gold and silver. You know, a lot of times Spain is being always pictured as being rapacious and greedy and, and the English are the very mild, minor people, you know. English were sent for the same reason. The problem is they went to Nova Scotia. All they found was good fishing spots and that's good. But they were going after the same thing. Unfortunately, they just didn't go to the right places. Spain did. And what resulted is by the end of the 16th century, Spain and England were commercial, colonial, political, and religious rivals. And for the second half of the century, the rulers of Spain, Philip II and Elizabeth I, they became bitter political personal rivals. Why was that? Well, Philip was married to Elizabeth's half-sister, Mary Tudor, during Mary's brief reign of five years as the only legitimate and only Catholic ruler of England since, uh, I mean, to follow Henry VIII. Elizabeth was raised a Protestant, but she promised Philip and Mary that when she succeeded to the throne, she would allow Catholicism to continue to flourish in England. Obviously, she broke that promise. She carried out tremendous persecution of the church. Thousands of people had died. Hundreds of priests died. You know, it's just the reality. And in the eyes of Philip, not only was that uh, uh, such a torture for him as a Catholic, but also Elizabeth was not, he in his mind, a legitimate heir. He was the illegitimate, illegitimate daughter of Anne Boleyn and King Henry VIII that Mary, Queen of Scots, was the actual heir apparent. Of course, Elizabeth eliminated that problem by having her beheaded. Besides the political quarrel and the, um, the religious difference, there was also the fact that Elizabeth I was sending out all these uh, war parties, these buccaneers, the famous sea dogs, and they were raiding all the Spanish colonial ships, bringing all this gold back, taking it over. Francis Drake and all those people. The rivalry existed uh, also religiously because uh, Elizabeth was all for the Protestants. Philip was for the Catholics. And he was trying to, because he was uh, heir to the what was the Holy Roman Empire that broke down at that time with nationalism. But Elizabeth was sporting the Protestant effort everywhere it was. Philip was trying to promote the Catholic uh, religion. Also, Philip was confronting the grave, grave threat, and that was the Ottoman Turks that were invading up through the Balkan countries all the way to Vienna. They went twice. They almost conquered all of Europe from that. Thanks be to God, they were pushed back twice. Uh, Elizabeth stayed out of the war. He, Philip had to fight it by himself, because why? Elizabeth and even the kings of France had deals, commercial deals with the Turks, and so they didn't want to get involved. And so Philip really resented all that. This meant that when the most serious confrontation occurred between the West and the Turks, as I mentioned, uh, they just stayed out of it. And it was very, very painful for Philip and very irritating to him. How did the legend grow? Well, it started with the printing press. It was the key factor in the growth of the dissemination of the black legend that Spain was this cruel, rapacious people that just white people out in front of them. Printing Press gave the English and the Dutch a wonderful time to promote all these little pamphlets saying all these kinds of horrible things about the Spanish. And some of the Dutch converts uh, were also revolting, revolting against Spain because at that time, Netherlands belonged to Spain. So they wanted to rebel and form their own little country. So from the presses in Holland and England, these propaganda pamphlets spread all over Europe. And they were always painted in the most horrific ways. If you look at these things, Spaniards were always depicted as cruel, lazy, bigoted, and fanatical. So different from the nice, well-bred, benevolent Englishmen and Dutchmen. For example, there was pamphlets full of supposed Spanish atrocities in the New World. Some pictures showing these Spanish people sitting around a fire roasting an Indian. 
Uh, other ones showed this uh, scene where uh, the, in the background is buildings, and it's obviously what they, they were Dutch style buildings. Though this guy never went to the place to record this stuff, he just made things up. Historian Philip Wayne Powell put it in his book called The Tree of Hate Propaganda and Prejudice Affect the United States Relationship with the Hispanic World. He said the killing of Indians by Spaniards, they became in these pamphlets atrocity and ruthless extermination. But when Englishmen ran Irishmen to death by the thousands in their own bogs or slaughtered them after surrender, this was called Irish problem. And in contrast to the alleged Spanish brutality, brutal, uh, brutalities, what do we get the image of the pilgrims sitting down to a nice little meal with those nice little Indians on Thanksgiving Day, huh? However, when you look at history, the relationship between the English and the French with Indians, it wasn't friendly either. Uh, the Puritan preacher, famous preacher, Cotton Mather, he considered the Catholic Church the Antichrist, literally. He had a very disparaging attitude towards the Indians. In fact, when they began to die because they didn't have the immunities, when germs came, he was delighted. Delighted because it, meant it made room for better growth, which means made room for people like him. Governor Bradford, he was governor of Massachusetts. His people took revenge because a raiding party, Indian raid party, killed some uh, white people. They wiped out the whole tribe. And he said the stink and stench of the burning process was terrible, but the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice and they, the English, gave praise, therefore, to God. Oliver Cromwell, he was another Puritan. He spoke in the singular, similar lang uh, language when he slaughtered 3,000 uh, Irishmen. Huh? Obviously, the Purit uh, Puritan deity was generally happy with the destruction of non-Puritans, especially if their bodies were burned. And it often is stated disparaging that the Spanish went just to the New World out of cupidity, greed, to get gold and silver and gems. Well, they all did. As I said before, the English were just unsuccessful. But the fact of the matter is, as we well know here in this country, we used to be on a gold basis, a gold system, then a silver system, and now that's all gone. But it was the fact that precious metal kind of marked your success and stability as a country. And that's why they were trying to find that and store it. So, and because the conquistadors were hired by the countries, I mean, obviously they probably like to keep some for themselves, but they would always bring us back to their country of origin. So Spain became fabulously wealthy uh, to the, literally the envy of uh, England and Spain, uh, England and uh, the Dutch. So what really happened? Well, we know in history, in 1519, Hernando Cortez came to the eastern shore of, of Mexico, the peninsula there, with 300 men. And then they began to move inward. Now their whole attempt was to literally make contact. They had heard that there was this great emperor lived in this magnificent city. They wanted to make contact and have a relationship with them. But as they came aboard, all of a sudden all these other Indian tribes came to join them. And the reason is because they had been so persecuted by the Aztecs in a very terrible way. Uh, the Aztecs seem to have built on the civilization of the Toltecs and in many ways architecturally, engineering wise, they were very civilized people. In fact, when the Spanish ended up at Tenochtitlan, now in Mexico City, Mexico City literally was a lake, a big lake, and this, they had these beautiful causeways built out to this magnificent city in the middle of the lake, gleaming white stone, and Bernal Diaz, the, uh, the secretary for Hernando Cortez, said that many of the conquistadors who had visited many of the cities in Europe said nothing matched it. And they were extraordinary. They were really advanced in that way. But they also encountered the demonic religion of what they did, their human sacrifice. And they think, a lot of scholars think that that was developed by Aztec authorities as a way of creating fear in their own people's lives, as a way of controlling other people and controlling the entire region. And it was literally human sacrifice. If you've ever been to Mexico City, you go to the Temple of the Moon, the Temple of the Sun, they're the big ziggurat towers, you go all the way up to the top. And literally what they would do is they would execute literally tens of thousands of people every year. And how'd they do it? They would have wars with other, uh, other tribes. And the whole purpose of the war was to go and get people and bring them. And they just didn't use them, they used their own ch people, even children. They so selected certain children, kept them in the nursery, and then they marched them up and they killed them. 
And if the children cried, they considered that a real mark of uh, real success and a blessing from the God because it would bring rain and new life to them. But Hernando Cortez comes on this scene and sees this absolutely demonic human religion. I mean, it's just uh, this demonic religion. And, and it was just horrifying because they take them to the top and they take an obsidian knife and they cut open your chest and they rip out your heart while you're still alive, throw the heart into the mouth of the god with kind of fire. And then oftentimes they would skin alive this person and they would put uh, the uh, skin on them, the priest would, and they'd run around the city with these bloody skins all over them. So you can imagine, the, and, and their hair was matted with crusted blood. It was just, just sickening. And they would kick the body and roll down the ziggurat steps all the way to the bottom and either animals ate them or the common person ate them, often cannibalism. In fact, Bernardo Diaz, the secretary, writes that, uh, that Cortez was invited to a dinner and he wouldn't touch any of the meat because he was afraid it was human sacrifice, it was cannibalism, he really felt that. Well, what happened was that uh, Cortez finally had it up to here with this murdering of all these people. So he ordered uh, uh, Montezuma to stop it, and he did. But that outraged the priest and even the people. And the end result was that a big war broke out there. Now, two things happened. The Aztecs would never back down from a fight. And the Spaniards, even though they were only 300, they were far superior in terms of their weaponry and their battle maneuvers. And they literally wiped out hundreds and hundreds and not thousands of these Indians. Now the Spanish lost some people and what the Indians, the Aztecs would do would cut off their heads and throw the heads at the uh, other part of the army to intimidate them. Well, it just made them angrier. Another thing is that they believed, especially Cortez, there was two or three incidences where he was literally liable. I mean, he was ready to be captured, could have been captured, uh, I mean, could have been killed three or four times but the Aztecs believed you don't kill the leader. You capture him, and then you use him for human sacrifice. And they caught Hernando Cortez a couple times, but they were arguing over who was going to get the credit for taking him, and he escaped any number of times. When one of the attacks, uh, Montezuma was killed by a stone, and the story first was told that the Spanish killed him. It wasn't the Spanish. It was the big rock or boulder was thrown by an Aztec, probably in... Uh, anger towards Montezuma because he capitulated to the Spanish. Uh, but the end result was because they had superior weapons and strategy, they took over the, uh, the country. Often, too, people say, how could it happen? And they said, well, all the other tribes formed and joined them because they were so angry. They wanted to destroy the Aztecs for hurting them for so many years and killing so many of their people in the most brutal way. During that time, you know, the fact that matters, you always have some abuse. You know, we're not foolish people to think that everybody was a saint and perfect. There was some abuse. Uh, but what the pamphlets of the, the black legend said, that the, all this abuse was going on, the fact of the matter, it wasn't. Uh, in the beginning, some of the successors of Cortez to Mexico City uh, were cruel and greedy. And the king was far away, and that was the problem. The ability to communicate was so far away. It took a while for it to get over there. It's not like we have text messages. It'd go three months over there. By the time it came back, it's six months or a year. And things had happened during that time. But by far and away, the king ordered not to have uh, any slavery, and so did the pope. And he appointed the bishop of, uh, of Mexico City as the protector of the Indians. In fact, he smuggled out through a, a messenger the message that the previous uh, leader of, uh, head of Mexico City was doing cruel things and the king had him removed. So there were some abuses, but there were a tremendous amounts of blessing and benefits. Under Cortez, the first hospital for Indians was established. In 1534, the Spanish organized and founded schools for the Indian girls. In 1539, they set up a printing press in the New World and they printed translations of all sorts of writing in the native language of the people so they could read it. Orphanages, trade schools, and colleges followed, even a university for Aztec students that was built in 1551. The curriculum was based on the famous university in Spain called Salamanca. The first class that graduated, the, the Aztecs were very bright people, very intelligent, but they were 
they graduated and the Spanish one was gonna hand over the university to them, but they were very hopeless in terms of organization. So they couldn't really handle running a university. Bright students, but not good organizers. Uh, the treatment of the Indians after the conquest, well, from the first discoveries in the New World, scholarly debate raged about, were these newly discovered people human or not? Because remember the Spanish, when they went to areas like in the Amazon and South America, they encountered very, very primitive tribes who were nothing like the Aztecs. Aztecs were certainly uh, very civilized people in the area of engineering, architecture, astronomy but obviously demonic in the religion. Well, the ultimate declaration of the church is that all these people are children of God. They are, and they need to be protected and cared for. In fact, the Catholic thinkers took seriously the statement of Pope Pius, uh, Paul II in 1537. Indians should not be treated like irrational animals and used exclusively for our profit and our service. They must not be deprived of their freedom and their possessions, even, they are, even if they're not Christian. And on the contrary, they must be left to enjoy the freedom and their possessions. You know, uh, also, you know, Cortez set up areas where he literally uh, gave areas to the Indians and he didn't have any Spanish interact. They took care of their own areas. Some areas he had Spanish governors, but he, he gave like land grants to certain of his, his uh, soldiers, but others were just designated. So they were very compassionate. They saw him as human beings that had a soul that needed to be evangelized. Now. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but I can talk about the obvious comparison between the Catholic view of rights of indigenous people with the French and the English. They didn't view it that way. They just wiped out the opposition, making treaties and then breaking them all the time. Spanish were very compassionate and very good and benevolent people. Well, in the first years of the conver uh, conquest of Mexico, very little conversions, very little. And then in 1531, we have that magnificent incident where Juan Diego, an Aztec Indian, beholds a woman and tells her to take these flowers in the middle of winter, these roses, Castilian roses, to the, to the Bishop of Rome, tell him to build a church here. And you know the story, it goes back and forth, they don't believe him, tell him to bring a sign, so he brings the roses, and then on the tilma appears this magnificent image that still confounds experts today. It's not anything of this world, not the colors, not the thing. And so beautifully pictured, because it shows a Aztec maiden with a Jewish roots, because she has a black ribbon around her, which is a Jewish sign that she's pregnant with a child. She stands in the sun and the moon, the gods of the Aztecs, with the, the stars on her thing. They say the stars on her dress and on her cloak, the mantle, that sea blue green, those were very sacred colors to the Aztecs were literally the constellation of the year 1531. Scientists have gone back in time and said that's exactly how the stars were. It's just a miraculous thing. Literally uh, images in the eye, they've done this, this spectrometry where they go deep into it. I'm telling you when that thing happened, all of a sudden, in literally in six years, eight million Aztecs became Catholic. Now you gotta remember what's happening across the, uh, the ocean over in Eng uh, Europe. Catholics lost about four and a half million to the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> Eight million came into the church through our Blessed Mother's intercession of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The importance of this mass conversion can't be overemphasized, because why? Because the conquered and the conquerors, what do they share now? A common religion, huh? And since Spanish were not like the English, they weren't racially prejudiced at all. Now, because they were Christian and Catholic, they were willing to intermarry, and they did producing a whole new uh, mestizo uh, blend of people. And uh, it was racially homogenous and it led to the, the pacification of the whole, uh, uh, whole country. And uh, the fact of the matter is that didn't happen with the English. Well, okay, you can say Pocahontas and John Smith, but that was about it, you know, it wasn't done that way. I've given you a sketch of the Spanish behavior in the Americas in some detail because it's the main feature, as I said, of the black legend, whether in 16th century Holland and England or even today, sadly, in American textbooks. Were the Spaniards unusually greedy and cruel compared to their English colonial rivals? Did the church violate natives' rights in the zeal for souls? The record speaks for itself. 
The answer is no. Atrocities that have been, all, uh, been in all the colonial enterprise, both by the colonists and the colonized, they were there, some, but they were hardly limited to the Spanish. It was the, the end effect of something, some country colonized another. You're always gonna have fights and breakouts and there'll be some killing. If you wanna just have some notes of that, just look back at the reports about the German colonists in Venezuela and the horrible atrocities that happened there. You never hear what was happening in Protestant areas and from Protestant countries. The fact is the church's solicitude for Indians in both spiritual and material uh, ways was really praiseworthy for people at that time. Of course, Spanish success in the New World is not the only component of the legend. The fact of the matter is you go further in the future with history, Spain was ruled by Franco, who was a very strong-handed, heavy-handed kind of leader, kind of almost a dictator. And in the liberal view, that just goes, shows you again, you look at what the Catholic Church does. They just dominate people, they wipe out people. If you don't agree with them, they just kill you. They did it to Indians, they're doing it now to their own people in Spain. But you know, one of the first revisionist works on the black legend to be published in the United States, as I mentioned before, is called The Tree of Hate, Propaganda and Prejudice Affecting United States Relations with the Hispanic World. And Philip Wayne Powell, discusses a lot of things and he says this, the 19th century liberation movement in Spanish America, which threw off the rule of Spain and produced numerous independent states of modern South and Central America, what did they do? They adopted a version of the black legend because it worked for them to break in rebellion from Spain, their mother country, and to set up their own independent. So for political powers, they used it. So you see this thing being recycled bringing up just like the Muslims are bringing up the Crusades. They had no interest in the Crusades. It wasn't recorded in Muslim history. They were inconsequential to them. But it was the colonists of France and England who wanted to use it to promote themselves that these new romantic uh, conquerors again were the Crusaders and then they picked it up and that's how it got back into our century now and why we're reaping uh, the, the, the hurricane of violence because of the seeds that were sowed back by the French and English colonists. Well, that happened. But the fact of the matter is, you even go into our country, there's always been this kind of disdain towards the Hispanic countries. Teddy Roosevelt, who took a dim view of non-Anglo-Saxon people, he considered that because the United States was a civilized nation, it must fi fight chronic wrongdoing throughout the Western Hemisphere. The Spanish-American War, Roosevelt, that was taking of Panama, all those things, huh? Taft's Dollar diplomacy. We're all supposed to make Hispanics what? Like us Americans. Wilson's missionary diplomacy, particularly in Cuba and Haiti, it was intended to show what? Those backward Hispanics, how to really elect good men and how to be like us. So it's a little wonder that American, Americans have what I call Hispanophobia. And it's been a whole staple diet of our schools and our textbooks because it, it often provoking a, a corresponding antipathy and distrust in the Hispanic world. So as far as the original Spanish colonization goes, we can concur with Louis Hanke that no European nation, possibly except Portugal, took her Christian duty towards native people that they conquered more seriously than did Spain. And it really was, as you look in history, considering everything, a great achievement. So hopefully this information can clear up a very black legend and dispel this myth. Amen.